Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to Parallel Session 6 of Local and Global Community Engagement. My name is Beth Eden. I am the Chief Executive Officer of a charity called QS World Merit, who gives back to young people doing amazing community work towards the Sustainable Development Goals and rewards them with career and education opportunities. It's amazing to be here. We have a wonderful esteemed panel coming up um, with presentations and lots of amazing insights to share. Um, I'd like to say firstly before we begin that I'm joining from the unceded territories of the Lekwungen peoples and this is otherwise known as Victoria Canada. Um, today we're going to be touching on local and global community engagement around how students and alumni in higher education can continue their work in local communities um, and this also includes how they get involved in their community and global engagement after graduating, as well, well as the key skills needed in a post-pandemic world, job market, as things are really changing for us, and uh, post-COVID. And I hope that our speakers can also speak to certain things and maybe raise some questions about what might need to change. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna welcome each speaker one at a time to share a little bit more about their work with you through a short presentation, and then we'll go to some questions. So first up today, we have Amar Hernandez, and Amar is the program manager of the UN Academic Impact Initiative. He served as a volunteer and a conference management specialist at the United Nations Climate Change Secretariat and as a consultant for the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. He's also volunteered for UN Agency for Palestine Refugees and worked um, in um, news and journalism across the world. He has a master's degree in cooperation for development and a bachelor's degree in international studies. So very uh, wonderful to have you, Amar. Um, please share a little bit more with all of us today about how your work relates to local and global community engagement. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Beth, for the presentation. And apologies because I didn't prepare my uh, apartment. It has been a long while since I don't speak in my apartment. I usually do it from my office, which is just uh, a block from where I am right now. Um, indeed, uh, probably the thing I will highlight the most from your presentation that uh, missed is the fact that I was a professor for 16 years. Uh, so now I am in the other side of the equation working for the United Nations engaging with universities, uh, which is a fun fact because I know the insights of how the, the, the universities and institutions of higher education in general work. Um, so we are an initiative house in the outreach division of the Department of Global Communications uh, in the United Nations Secretariat um, here in New York. And um, the main uh, focus of our work is to engage with universities and colleges, but also think tanks and research centers to not only to advance um, UN principles and goals, including of course the sustainable development goals, but also to, to promote the work that universities are doing in terms of teaching, uh, research and community engagement and we also serve as a sort of bridge between the universities and the entire UN system. As of now, we have over 1,600 members, uh, universities and colleges in 154 countries. Um, so this is a, a remarkable and vast network. Um, and, you know, uh, not only as a professor, as a former professor myself, uh, I used to teach international law and international journalism for a very long time. So I, I could see with my own eyes uh, what the university where I was teaching, which is located in my home, my home country, I'm from Venezuela originally. So I saw all this wonderful work that my own students were doing in the, at the community level, particularly on human rights issues, which is a critical aspect of the work of the university, but also a sensitive issue in my home country. Um, so uh, now, many years later, working for the United Nations, I have been privileged enough to see firsthand all the wonderful work that universities are doing in that domain. We, we actually did uh, some months ago a workshop about how um, the universities in, in the global south, particularly, were aligning their projects related to community engagement with, with the sustainable development goals. And I was not surprised when I saw that the main leaders of those projects are not faculty or staff, but students. 
Um, so students have very innovative ideas and creative solutions to the local problems that every community faces on a daily and regular basis. Um, they have the knowledge, they have uh, probably not the technical expertise, but they certainly know how to hear their peers. They also know what's going on in their own communities and they also provide insightful comments um, and they make very pertinent questions as well to the local governments, to civil society organizations in which they are mostly the leaders, particularly not only the youth chapters of such organizations, but overall, the students are the drivers of change. And they actually uh, heavily impact the decisions of their own universities about what they should do uh, to take advantage of the resources, the intellectual resources that they have. But also, students and youth are, are amplifiers of messages. So whenever they engage with the community, with leaders of churches, foundations, even very local organizations working on human rights or humanitarian issues in very complex settings and the scenarios, but also on environmental um, topics, uh, climate change mitigation and so on. We have plenty of examples of how students are the ones who are really leading these projects. Um, they have the motivation they have the aspirations um, and they certainly believe that their generation is not the one uh, to be blamed for the many challenges that we see in the world. But even though they are not the ones to be blamed, they are the ones to be trusted with the solutions that we need to the problems that we have. So uh, whenever we seek for uh, how do we solve things, how, would do, how do we address these global, regional, national, very local challenges, the solution or the answer I would say usually is the same. We have to go back to the youth. We have to go to the students because I, I, I was actually commenting with someone earlier today, this, this famous phrase that the students are the leaders of the future. It happens to be a fact. And I was I was talking with a, a colleague, a, a group of colleagues actually on, uh, during lunchtime uh, from UNDP, the UN Development Program. And we were discussing that, that it is a fact that future leaders are the ones graduating right now from the universities. Right now, the students that we see in the classroom, in the labs, in the in the research centers, these are the people that, that are going to take over the power in most of most of the countries around the world. That is a fact. So, if that is a reality, if we can embed issues or topics of sustainability, if these uh, are the people that are motivated, that are passionate, that that they need only perhaps orientation, the voices need to be heard because the voices are there. So we don't need to create opportunities for them to speak. Those opportunities already exist. More importantly than hear them is taking what they say into consideration to actually include what they say, what they think in the design and implementation of public policies, even at the very local level. And I've seen myself and my colleagues working with civil society that, you know, whenever they do and we do ourselves events, um, in uh, when we include students, we, we hear wonderful things. Just on 24 October last month uh, for you and they, we had an event here at UN headquarters and we had a panel of experts from different universities, but we also had a panel of students. And you could see how they, they don't care about anything, any formality. They, they just say what they think. They just express themselves. And it was very interesting to hear that every single one of them is doing at least one project at the local level with even, and this is what this was very surprising for me, not only established NGOs, but NGOs that they created themselves, um, in, even on, on a digital platform or online with their peers around the world. And we also have this connection with the Millennium Campus Network. They have thousands of students around the world that are doing local projects with NGOs or through their universities to solve or to address specific issues related to one or more of the SDGs. So this is all to say that in the United Nations Academic Impact, and I will uh, speak on behalf of the whole United Nations Secretariat, the, uh, the UN system even, we truly believe that students are wonderful stakeholders that we really need to take into account, that we really need to consider their needs. I'm very happy that actually a few months ago in September, the, the, the General Assembly approved the creation of an office precisely to, to address the needs of the youth and to hear more about what the youth needs in order to have the world that not only they want, but also the, the world that we need. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Well, that was such a great beginning of this, this whole session. I think we all felt the passion, but also the, the huge ask that you're giving 
that it's not just tokenism and engagement for young people, but it's actually allowing them to sit at the table and, and be a part of policy implementation um, and the decisions for their future. So a really wonderful part about how engagement can encompass so much. So thank you so much for starting us off on a really good foot. Um, the next person I would really like uh, to introduce you to is Maria Jose, and she is a master in management and production of contemporary arts at the University of Lille in France. She has been working for more than 18 years um, on international education. Her present role is a global curriculum and special project manager at ITESO, I hope I said that right, and the Jess Suit University of Guada, Guadalajara. There we go. She was head of international affairs of Ministry of Innovation, Science and Technology at the state of Jalisco until 2021 and part of her career includes being part of the internationalization office at the university uh, mentioned before. She has a special uh, speciality from the Institute of the Future with the intention of continuing to create transversal impact projects for future generations. Um, so without further ado, Maria, I hope that summed you up okay and uh, we're really excited to hear a little bit more about how your work encompasses local and global engagement. Thank you very much, Beth. Um, actually, yeah, you did a great job. I just want to process this Guadalajara because of the hood, yeah, you know, the persons of the state of Jalisco. So uh, our university is DTS, but it's, it's great. I know that it I is difficult to pronounce. <laughs> So thank you very much uh, for you and all the organizers. Uh, and for me, it's a true honor to be here with all, all the colleagues all over the world. And um, I was invited to talk about uh, the context of global and local engagement, and I will do so. But first, I will ask the audience and you, my colleagues, to take a little trip to the future with me. So I suggest everybody that adjust the devices put the bells on and let's imagine our future in 15 years from now okay so we are going to the future right now <laughs> so the next 15 years will pass very quickly in the macro changes coming from the globalization no? the demography the nature the technological revolutions and global security um we'll have uh, restructure our personal life and our communities while these impacts will vary depending on where we live, they will affect our personal circle. Imagine a city of the future. What do you see? Do you see clean streets? Do you see flying cars? Do you see robots doing all the work? Um, do you see green buildings all over the place? Do you think about how do you receive your food do you think what it is nutritional values? Do you see the traffic? If there is such a thing as the perfect smart city, we will see a smart mobility issue there, no? Or perhaps your vision, it's more dystopian. Maybe with the big brother style uh, authoritarian re regime or a dark alleys full of crime or people forced to live in in sealed pods or some disaster happening what about education what do you have in mind after the global pandemic the some school closure the nationwide remote instructions the role of education has never been more critical or more entertaining when all settled what will education look like? And what will it inspire to do? Is it a happy place or it is a dystopian place? Keep that image of the future in your mind, okay? So now we are at the present. And if, <laughs> if we can share uh, the image that I brought, please. Thank you, Catherine. So this is the present. A few days ago, somebody asked to an AI to draw Mexico City in 2044. No more instruction, just the vision of the metadata and the AI of the future of one of the biggest city in the world. The pictures that result, 
for this that I show you. And this is more a dark future. This is no a world with no water, with few people, with not enough food. And if you think about education, that image here is very uncertain. Back to few people, no? What will I look like if you talk about your city to the AI? Something dark or something more bright? It is a tool, right? And no one really knows what the future holds. On, and, and then also I remember the proverb, the Chinese proverb that said that the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, but the second best time is now. So there is no better or worse way to experience the passage of time, but there is actually one really, really good answer to the question, when does the future start? And that future just starts now. So as much, um, so what I am doing now, no, what to, to, to erase this future of Mexico City of any city of Mexico that could be like that, so dark, uh, I am interested in facilitating dialogues, which address, for example, COIL and other global initiatives. And ANITESO, we are now reaching more students through COIL and GNL initiatives than any other internationalization effort. And the fact that these collaborations are free for students open also benefits to a larger population. So we increase access for all students regardless of their ability to participate in traditional mobility programs. And we are looking at uh, how to encourage professors and students to address SDGs, to find local solutions. And the return of uh, in-person internationalization is an opportunity for us to close the gap together with diverse internationalization efforts so that they are more collaborative and more integrated into the curriculum. Um, we are, for example, mixing code with our local efforts, and this is our number. So next slide, please. Yep. <laughs> so uh, we are mixing. So we reach, instead of 200 students, we reach 8,000 experience that will change the image of our future. And all this travel just to tell you that we are ready to build the right future together. Uh, that's for me. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I've got to say that's probably the most engaging presentation I've I've seen. And in this type of space, it's really <laughs> it's really good fun. It's a it's a good idea that we're, we're in an engagement session, I guess. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing um, and creating this this idea of a, of a new world with us. Um, really wonderful, wonderful points that you mentioned that we'll definitely feed back on in some of our questions coming up. Um, without further ado, I, I would like to introduce you all to our last um, speaker today. We've got Carol Ma with us. Hello, Carol. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Carol is the Associate Professor and Head of, of General, I can't speak today, <laughs> Gerontology uh, mm -hmm. Program, Senior Fellow uh, of Centre for Experiential Learning at Singapore University of Social Sciences. She is known among academia and the community sector as an active and passionate practitioner of service learning and um, ageing in, in Asia. Currently, uh, Carol is the Senior Fellow for the Centre for Experiential Learning, Associate Professor and Head of Ger Gerontology Programmes, Masters and PhD, I'll put my teeth in, at Singapore University of Social Sciences. She is, the, uh, she is leading the curriculum development, community engagement and research in gerontology and promoting transdisciplinary education to address ageing issues. She has led various aging and service learning projects, namely the Elder Learning Development Project, the Age Friendly Cities Project, accredited by the World Health Organization, and the Intergenerational Project on Health and Wellbeing. In the view of pandemic, in the, of the view of the pandemic, uh, Carol has taken the lead to work on a project um, for dementia care during COVID nineteen uh, pandemic with National Archives of Singapore and Dementia Singapore. Incredible. Welcome, Carol. We're really excited to learn from you. Over to you. 
Thank you, Beth. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitations to let me share about my work. Yeah, maybe I can show the PowerPoint, so that's why um, you all can understand more about my work. Actually, I originally come from Hong Kong. I uh, have been doing a lot of work in youth and also aging. So when I was young, I actually also was appointed as a member under the Commission on Youth in Hong Kong. So I've been doing a lot of uh, promotion about youth empowerment and also now focus more on aging. Then I focus more on lots of the intergenerational program. So we have a lot of young people here right today. So I hope that, you know, one of the issues that we actually also quite alarming is about aging population. So without further ado, maybe I can show my PowerPoint. Um, Catherine, is that okay that you help me to show my PowerPoint? Thank you, thank you very much. So I actually um, put here, uh, surface learning is my lifelong learning practice. Because if you look at uh, surface learning, actually is uh, one of the uh, pedagogy under the community engagement. And throughout my 20 years of my academia life, and I actually trying to go to different countries to promote service learning and practice. Because uh, when I was in Hong Kong, uh, we are actually the first uh, university that I uh, set up the Office of Service Learning. And then afterward, we vitalized the service learning network in, uh, in Asia. So we actually train a lot of young people and also teachers uh, to use service learning to address the social issue in the whole Asia. And of course, because of this, a lot of people, they also invite me to give talk about service learning in Asia, the development and also its practice. So this actually are some of the country that I've been uh, and then to also talk about our work in service learning in Asia. So we can actually, you can also see the map. Currently, we have a number of uh, university also engaged in service learning. So can we click uh, next slide? Yeah, so you see um, there, there actually, uh, you see the red dot, right? Actually, uh, those country also uh, with service learning. Then we go to the next slide. Yeah. So you see actually here, uh, those country in Asia are rapidly uh, developed and also working on service learning and community engagement in Asia. So the reason that I want you to know more about uh, what's happening in Asia is because I come from Hong Kong and then I moved to Singapore uh, six years ago. Yeah, and then uh, because I want to know more about how I can further contribute to Asian context. So that's why uh, in my six years time, actually, I do a lot of work uh, in Asia and understand more about how country address different social issues. And but the, the most important is uh, not only the teachers, but also the students. But what actually we need is, uh, next slide, is actually other than we, you know, because I'm, yeah, I was young before, yeah, and I believe in, you know, the empowerment of the young people. Yeah, but I think uh, they're also important for us, yeah, we are talking about higher education. The role of teachers is also very important. So how you develop the curriculum, how you conduct the reflection, it's not just you have the students to go out to address the, you know, the social issue, but it's when they come back, how we can help them to articulate and make them to have to be more critical and really reflect about their experience. So if you look at the next slide, so what we try to do is to help students to make connection and transfer their learning to and from similar and dissimilar learning context. And so if actually students engage in doing service, right? And then if you actually know how to guide them properly, or they can actually even teach you what's happening in the local context, what's happening in the international context, then that become a, you know, a very important learning growth for both teachers and students. So because of my 20 years of experience in uh, service learning and community engagement, so I actually developed a model. And this model is something that I hope we all can think about for the future. So the next slide. So in here, right, um, actually Chinese philosophy, we actually always talk about, we have to start from ourselves first, and then you serve your family, and then you serve your local community, and then you serve the global community. Yeah, and that's why we always talk about global citizens, right? But before we do that, we have to actually think about uh, how are we going to do it uh, by individual. So we need to actually have character education. So in Asia context, we have a lot of education and school. They focus more on character education. So start from self. Yeah, and then others. When you are actually going into the second stage, that means nowadays we have a lot of young people here, the youth development. So how we actually see our own development. 
And then also how the family educate us. So the family education is very important. Then in the school, how we actually embed this into our pedagogy. And then to embed it, to let the young people know that, you know, the importance to share and also to contribute. And then from there, then we actually look at the community. Because what we are all doing is all related to community development. Cannot be just rely on one person. Young people, you are very, very good. Yeah, but we have to actually get more people to work together to address the social issues that become also a national citizen education afterward. Yeah, and then in the long run, right, if we talk about global citizenship, then we also need to have this concept of global citizenship education. For example, if you come to Asia, you cannot just use what you have learned in the state or in Canada to apply in my Asian context, right? You have to understand about local context. So the communication is actually very important. The whole process, we need academic work together. We need students work together. We need community work together because we need to actually hear about each other's voice in order to uh, understand how to uh, advance the betterment of the society. So this is actually a framework for us uh, to think about. But I think the most important is throughout the process, we need to actually reflect. Yeah, and we have to actually do a critical reflection. And for example, like uh, I always tell my students and along like, so when we do any project, so we have to ask ourselves before we go to bed, talk to yourself, we think that what you have learned today and what you can do better today. Yeah, and so it's something that's very simple, but actually, actually for doing a community engagement, actually it's simple. Yeah, it's a matter of how we actually start engagement, how we enable people to serve, and how we enable the community to work together, and at the end, to have empowerment in the community. So my question to you all is to think about your role, yeah, whether you are teachers or students, or maybe, you know, uh, a government official, or even, you know, or mayor, you are from UN, right? And I really hope that we are talking about principle, but somehow we have a lot of policy and principle, but how we can actually really put it into the ground, because a lot of countries, they have different cultural contests, political contests, how we actually really think about it when we start our community engagement. So um, I stop here, but later on, if we can have more uh, exchange, then I can share more about my views. That oh, was really great, Carol. And I think a really nice question that might be something that we can pull on next all together is about how do we really prepare and empower students so when they come out of you know university post graduation to continue their work in community and global development. There are skills. There is so much incredible opportunity at university. How do we ensure that that continues like into employment and passed uh, into their adult lives. Um, and, and the one person that I, I guess I'll direct this question to to begin this discussion is Maria. Um, would you be able to speak uh, more to that? Thank you, Beth. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I think there are multiple ways, no? Because we have multiple profiles in, 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 uh, in different kind of institutions. So something that maybe works for me, not, uh, they maybe not work for others. But uh, we can start with showing them no, what, where they are starting and acknowledging their own features or tools that they already have no, and uh, the, the, the own way that they think and recognize their own value no, and contributions. Um, to recognize as well that uh, education is a privilege, the higher education is a privilege, and that they have to take the disadvantage too, not for them, but for the community. No? And then we, we can do support them. Um, we have here at Aditeso um, a word that it is a GCIT word, uh, that is accompaniment. So we are not gu guiding them through an answer, but just uh, be in the same path with them in order to that if they need something, they can provide another tool that maybe they didn't know. No, as, as Omar said, um, uh, like this, this kind of, uh, yeah, they know, but not, maybe they don't have the technical issue, but they know what they want. So we are there from them. So that is empowered. And as an example that I have, uh, we actually have at ITESO uh, a professional application project which is a kind of fieldwork with a community engagement contribution. 
And we started last year with an example of a coil combined with this type of classes and to add the global component. And the students who were working with Market University, uh, we, we expect, we, we, we think no, that the empowerment was to find the solution for the community that they were working with because there was uh, some economic issues going on in the project. So we think that maybe that was like some solutions, but they are like free to, to, to find it. But in a very <laughs> mega brief summary, the empowerment was not there, but was with the market university when one student came that he speak Spanish and English. So they translate all the Spanish uh, data to the companions. So it was so empowered for them to be in this community and to can speak in both ways that he continues doing it. So yeah, so that's the kind of things that you do not expect. But the thing is to be there in order that if they need something, you can provide it. And I think that is the more empowered thing that you can do. No? That let them to have something for their own and to show their own values. Yeah, I, I really love that. The sense of belonging behind what you were saying, sense of belonging of young person. Carol, it sounds it looks like you're ready to go. <laughs> if you go, chef. I just want to add on something. Uh, I think uh, as a university, right? I think one thing is very important that how we can actually convey the vision and mission of the university to the students. So I give you an example. So uh, my previous years in university is actually the the mission is education for service, and for Singapore University of Social Sciences is a university for social good, a university for lifelong learning. So when the students, they choose this university, they know that actually our goal is to create so, so good. So for those who come in, they will join together. So I think the mission and vision of the university is very important. How you actually really tell your students about, you know, what you actually want to train them. Yeah, and this actually become a values. Yeah, and then, but of course, we understand that young people, they are heterogeneous. Yeah, not everyone is the same yeah because they have different background yeah so training is very important when we talk about community engagement so we need to do need assessment right when we work with young people we also need to do need assessment because different young people they have different skill set and they actually we have to actually discover their potential so training is very important to talk to them how they actually understand more about themselves discover their strength and weaknesses yeah because even though you have weaknesses but how we can address it how we can actually create peer learning and how this can actually become a you know potential and strength that can work with the community so i think it's something that we have actually bear in mind that um not every young people they are ready to serve but if actually give them uh, some training and also let them know that you know how we can actually not disrupt the society sometimes we may think that oh i can change the society but we understand that you cannot change the society in one day so we have to let them know that it also take time. Yeah, we have to do it step by step. Yeah, and because, you know, sometimes they may have a lot of energy. Yeah, and but we have to actually work together. It doesn't mean that we don't want to change. We actually, actually nowadays, we cannot foresee any change, right? Yeah, because tomorrow there will be another virus. Yeah, and then it's a lot of, we are all living in a vulgar, vulgar world. Yeah, and a lot of uncertainty also. But of course, what we can do is, okay, now we are live in this moment. So what we see the problem, then can we actually address it together? So we have to really plan for it. We need to actually think about what's next. So I think uh, so the empowerment part actually come from, uh, you know, the experiential learning, the training, experience, engage, then you will have empowerment. I love that so much. It was really interesting what you said that there's also like different elements that young people can bring or people in, in general can bring to a societal problem that it is yeah. so like we need so many different types of skills and abilities and qualities in young people um, in, in order to tackle those problems. And we can't do it one day by one person. It takes an army. So I think that's a really wonderful message for community engagement that the whole point of community engagement is community, right? Like there's such a collaboration of efforts. Um, Amar, do you have anything to say there from your experience? You do, good, good. <laughs> um, indeed. Um, you know, when when you, one person wants goes to a university or a college, the expectation is that he or she will receive 
tertiary education in order to get a degree. Uh, but in reality, in addition to receiving knowledge, which is important in itself, universities need to go into capacity building, which is goes mm. way beyond providing technical um, knowledge regarding specific areas or fields. You need to prepare them for life. That's the first thing. The second thing is that you need to nurture their, their wish to, to make a significant and meaningful contribution to the society, something that most of them already have. But it is the role of universities, is, is, and I'm not talking about social corporate responsibility. I'm talking about intellectual social responsibility, which is completely different. But also, we need to rethink the role of universities in the world. I think the notion uh, that university was this kind of a Olympus of knowledge, very close to the to the environment, that were close to the rest of our societies. That kind of notion is has been left in the past, I want to believe. But also, if you are very pragmatic about it, uh, more most of the private sector companies, most of the public sector uh, potential employment places, they are really looking forward to be more sustainable. They want to wash their image. They want to be greener. They want to be more um, acceptable by the consumers, by all of us. Um, Either if, if, if it is because of a good reason or just purely a business model, because they see there is a high demand for having products and services made and offered by companies that are actually more sustainable and greener, then we need to nurture the mindsets of these students for the ideally for them to say, hey, I have not only the technical knowledge, but I also have this sustainable skill set that I can provide and bring to the table and to really rethink your operations, rethink the processes that you already are conducting. So the idea is that these recent graduates go into the companies or, or the public sector and they say, hey, I know my, my thing, but I also know how to be more sustainable. And I'm pretty sure that, that, that that's a kind of um, thing that, that students will appreciate quite a lot because their employability increases because there is a high demand to have professional graduates, regardless of the field, that are more environmentally conscious, that are more aware of the global challenges, that are more aware of human rights issues and fundamental freedoms and so on. Absolutely, the virtual clap. I was gonna try to get that Zoom hands, you know, you can clap. <laughs> but it's a really good point. And I think my question back to you, Amal, it'd be, you know, we talk about we need 21st century skills, you know, there's a, a changing job market, we're in a post pandemic world, we might be going through a recession, what skills do we need in young people then to navigate this new world and this new job market when we are prioritizing new things, such as sustainability? Um, I, I believe, you know, uh, in most uh, fields, I would say the in the not so distant past, the idea was you do something and you follow a, a paradigmatic way of a model format setting, and then you have an outcome or result, which tends to be exactly the same over the over the years. Now we have to instill more innovation, more entrepreneurship, more um, creativity. But this is something that students already have. They, 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 but they, so what the role of universities, if their students already have that, and this sensitivity, this awareness. So what the university need to do is to guide the students in the right direction and, and to nurture this skill that they already have with the proper tools and, and the proper skills uh, on a secondary level, perhaps, with the experience of those who are already in the field, who are already working in companies, so the, this purely academic approach that some universities used to have, again, this is something that we need to leave in the past. Um, and we have we are seeing also, as I said, many companies, as you said yourself, Beth, the job market has changed. But also, universities are acknowledging the fact, and I have I see this on a daily basis. Universities now want to be more sustainable. They want to be greener because the students are demanding that, because the students are pushing for that in their own institutions. So I believe we, we can talk for hours about what kind of skills, and, and I agree with what Carol said, and we are truly advocates. I'm a, I'm a global citizen myself, in addition to being a Venezuelan citizen. I truly believe that you have to have empathy. You have to have this acknowledgement that 
The problems you might be facing at the local level might be similar, if not identical, problems in the other part of the world uh, that you can join forces. And we have something that we didn't have 20, 30 years ago. We have the technology, although we have a digital gap, and we have all these things related to access to technology, connectivity, and so on, which are very important, by the way. But we have these potential opportunities to engage, to communicate. Did you imagine we are, we are having this virtual panel five years ago? That was impossible. You need to go to a special place, to a special technology with IT team. And now we can do this pretty much on a regular basis. Uh, and I think all of us are, are, are doing remote work, hybrid work, and people working with people from all around the world. We have the technology, so we have the advantage here. What we need is to have a more conscious environment that makes it even more plausible to be more sustainable, then there's something that's not necessarily related to the environment or the ecology, which are important considerations of the term. But sustainability is all about poverty, human rights, equality, justice, uh, access to water, and the like, as the SDG said to tell us. So this is what the chief that we need to see, not only in the universities, but also in those who are going to hire uh, professional graduates. Can I, can I share also? Carol and Maria. And yes. by the way, before you share, people get every get your comments into the Q&A section. We're going to be doing a Q&A session next. Go ahead. Okay, so I think, uh, you know, um, to echo or may I mention, I think we have to also look at the future economy. Yeah, because it related to the job skills, right? So uh, if we look into the future economy, yeah, so during the pandemic, we actually understand that care economy is very important. And then digital economy is very important. And because of the climate change, green economy is very important too. And then now we also talk about, you know, technology, use of technology, also, you know, all the advanced uh, materials, the industrial 4.0 economy is important. So when you look at the economy, right? So what kind of skill set that what we need? So definitely care economy, you need a lot of people skills, communication skills, and then you need to actually understand about the health and wellness, person-centered care and teaching and learning. So when we look at the uh, digital economy, of course, AI data, because we all talk about iCloud and system because of, you know, like this morning, right? I tried to log into the system. Also, I have to learn about it also. So it's something that related to skill set that how we can actually connect to the society. Green economy, of course, the skill set related to how we actually understand about the environment. Yeah, and then so, uh, you know, the sustainability management. So it's actually a lot of things that we can learn. But again, it goes back to what the young people, they want to work in different economy. So, uh, you know, if young people, they want to go to the care economy, definitely they have to equip themselves that with the skill set under the care economy. So I think it's a lot of things that, uh, as what Amara mentioned, that could be a one hour talk. <laughs> yeah, but somehow I think it's important for us as an educator and also young people you are here yeah, to understand more about what's actually the future economy. So that's why you uh, you can better equip yourself. We cannot learn all the skills, but somehow we actually can actually target some of the skill set that we actually feel comfortable or maybe we are willing to learn more because nowadays we need to keep learning in order to equip us to face the future uh, society. And if I may very quickly, <laughs> I, I do agree for the, um, the skills that I need now in order to the next five years, maybe. But what about the future <laughs> again? Um, I think that the technical skill will change and the demand of each company and the economy and it will change because people are growing, other interests are in, other things are happening all over the world. But the soft skills are futureless. So, if, if you have like your time management, if you have empathy, if you have like the, the, the kind of skills that are more for life and you center all the, 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 the people in the center of all of the, the designs of the whatever is, <laughs> design that you do, you, you put the people on the center, then you have the skills required. Um, and, and that's my contribution. <laughs> I love how the engagement session is very engaging. Right, this is amazing. You've all raised some very, very important points. Um, we have some questions coming in. So I'm going to kind of give the floor over to some of these questions now. Um, and we can see if we can answer those. So we have someone um, who's from the Sustainability Sustainable On The Go Youth Engagement Programme, the representative and a student of Okayama University. Hello. Um, 
and they wish to ask the speakers um, how language barriers can be addressed to facilitate engagement between local and global economies. Uh, really important question as we're talking about global issues. Um, would anybody here on the panel like to answer that? If I may. Uh, because we are an international organization, as you know, and we have six official languages, but you know, our members, institutions talk in many, many different languages and dialects. So this is an issue also because there's, there's a, a very persistent dominance of the English language that we need to 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 start to, to think because all the academic production, most of it is in English, so the one that is usually considered in academic journals and papers in conferences and even in policy making comes from Anglophone countries. And of course, that means that the production made in universities in the global south is somehow neglected, not to mention the contribution of students. Um, having said that, um, we have again the, the technology, whenever this technology is available to precisely help to you know, navigate those waters. But it's not only about uh, translating one thing to the other. This, this is why in the UN we have the term interpretation, because it's not not, not only a literal translation language A to language B. You have to also understand the context, the cultural background behind that, which is very important when it comes to trying to understand once what somebody is saying. So the, 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 the technology exists, yes. Well, we also need to acknowledge the fact that we we need to also understand, and this is why again the concept of global citizenship is so important. We need to really understand the cultural background, the contextual realities of peoples uh, all over the world. To me, I think uh, you know definitely if you actually work with uh, different people from different countries, then maybe uh, a language barriers. But that's also the opportunity for us to think about how we can address it. Yeah, and I was in Japan in July. Yeah, and I don't know how to speak any Japanese at all. Yeah, when I communicate with the Japanese community, the local community about aging. Yeah, and I actually use my Google Translate app. So that helped me a lot. But of course, if you actually work with, uh, you know, you're actually talking about local to global, right? Or global to local. So actually it would be good that you partner with the local university and then they can actually be your interpreter. And the most important when we do community engagement, so uh, it's about your heart, it's about your passion, it's about where, how you actually care and what you want to do. So if you see language is a barrier, there are a lot of things that you cannot do. So uh, what I want to encourage you to think of solution. Yeah, and then so what actually we can do, even though we have language barrier, and there must be a way that we can address it, right? Yeah, and for example, uh, what I know when we actually send students to Indonesia or India, India or other places to do surface program, we will actually give them a basic language course. Yeah, and you, if you want to actually go to serve in certain country, maybe you should also consider to learn some basic uh, language. So uh, that actually will help to, you know, uh, connect you with people also. So again, uh, go back to your language barrier. At the end, it's all about your heart and passion. So I hope that you can actually think from another uh, alternative and see it as an opportunity for you to connect with the people. I completely agree with what uh, Carol says, and uh, I will say that also, for example, I, I work uh, with a uh, deaf community, um, and when we work with them, I didn't speak like, like the, same, the, line, the, the sign language uh, because um, it, it changes from every country. But um, we have three countries represented there, and the thing is they communicate because they want to. They, they want to achieve something and they want to, to play a performance. So they start communicating only by images or like something uh, to show how it is done. And this is the, the purest uh, form of communication that I see and it works very well. So yeah, I, I completely I agree with Carol. It's something that you want to do and that it's not a very Wow, that's really a, um, a wonderful story. And all the stories that you've all shared about how we're eliminating barriers to engage globally and locally. And we actually have a question here 
um, from someone in the audience again. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A or the chat box and Catherine will, will see to those. Um, one of the questions, which is like a, a double barreled question is, how do we engage students who have less of the global perspective, but have a very engaged local level perspective um, and engagement? And how do we, we help them to draw the parallels between their lived reality in a local context, um, while also being able to sympathize or collaborate or whatever with other peers and community, communities globally? Really, really great question. Who would like to go ahead? Do you want me to simplify it? <laughs> I think I think, um, I think the most important is about the training, yeah, and how you actually really understand about the cross uh, cultural context, yeah. Because I think what I see a lot of uh, study abroad program or global study program, they just send students to the local context, yeah, and then so let them to explore about the context by themselves. But I, I think we actually need to really prepare the students. I give you an example why we have service learning Asian network. It was because we actually a lot of American university, they send students to Asian uh, to do a student exchange and also service learning program because we have a lot of developing country in Asia, right? And they come to serve actually is very good. Yeah, but um, some of the teachers actually mentioned about that. Yeah, that's very good for them to come. It's easy for them to come, but for our students, they find it difficult to go to other country because of the uh, economic uh, situation and other thing, right? Yeah, and then they also find out something that because different cultures, sometimes um, they find their local context being Americanized. Yeah, I think it's too late. Yeah, but they have this reflection yeah, about uh, Americanization. So that actually make the local students feel that, oh, they may ignore their local con cultures. So then I think of how actually we can prepare students, not only the students who are going to the local uh, uh, local contest, but also how we receive the global students to our own country, right? That should be a two way. So the training to both local and global students are very important because we have to respect each other's cultural context. We have to understand about uh, each other's political situation. We have to understand about you know different social contexts and different education system. It doesn't mean that what you have in your own country is something that I should have in my own country. Yeah, and I think uh, whether the country will go for uh, you know different development or not. Yeah, it takes time for them because as I mentioned, if we want to make change, right? It doesn't mean that we can make change in one day, but we have to really look into different stakeholders how we can work together. So, uh, you know, if you ask me, training is a main issue before we send students to any country. And then another thing is uh, prepare and also do with a refreshing and debriefing with the students every time when you have any overseas study program. And it will be good that if you do this kind of reflection together with the local students and local community partners, then they can also voice out their concern and what do they think? Because what you think, oh, you can actually do this. This will be good for your community. But the community village will think of the villagers may think about, no, how about if you guys gone? Then what will happen? Then I will go back to the, you know, the, the zero. I mean, the, the starting point. So it, it's something that I think we have to really bear in mind that how we build relationship with the local community and how actually we can respect them and by listening their voice. Yeah, Omia, you mentioned about the voice of the young people is very important. I agree, but the voice of other stakeholders are also very important. It's a matter of how we compromise at the end. Yeah, I hope I can answer the questions. A fabulous point, Carol, thank you so much. Would anyone else like to touch on, touch on anything about, yeah, yeah, Maria, go ahead. <laughs> I, I just want um I just want to add yes um um it is like a point level that you have to 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 listen to all the people no that that diversity means no you have more diversity you have more uh, persons to listen to but we can like um, just ask no what we share and then start there and I think that the the the, the thing is uh, to communicate with the others and then what we share no we are humans. We are person that 
uh, cares about the planet that we live and then we can start sharing maybe problems that uh, water is polluted in the both sides no so what we can share about it and i think that that's the the point that we can start the starting point yeah absolutely that's we all share a passion and uh hopefully and uh, a kind of responsibility to act on local issues in our communities that we are a part of um Amar, did you want to share anything on those things yes you did go ahead so actually i was thinking about uh, some research i did a long time ago about world public opinion if that actually is a thing that exists and uh, i used to argue there that some people say that we cannot speak about like world op or global opinion public opinion because there are so many different cultural backgrounds and um, you know uh, sets of thinking and ways of seeing life but in reality, what we what we have seen, um, you know, particularly when it comes to sustainability issues, is that despite all these differences, which are which are very evident, uh, you know, contextual, you know, distinctions between regions and countries, even within countries, we see these differences. Nonetheless, problems tends to be very similar. Their impact also tends to be very similar. Their solutions might be similar. So we really need to acknowledge that despite all this difference, we share our good chair, I'm sorry for redundancy of common problems, um, which might have, you know, details that are not quite identical, but certainly um, I believe that the, the, what I love about globalization, if we don't take it, that, that, that term has been somehow severely under attack by the, its you know, trade, financial, economic connotation. But if you see the term globalization from a completely different perspective, you see that this, uh, this um, notion that we are living on the same planet, we are just one race, which is human race, and that the fact that you know, we have completely different ways of thinking or, or living, nonetheless, we can learn from each other. We can learn from best practices and experiences. We can exchange ideas. Um, we don't have, uh, we, we say this a lot in the UN, not only I'm speaking not from the UN academic impact perspective, but the, from the UN perspective, we don't have a universal, magical uh, and globalized solutions um, because the reality on, in the field on the ground is quite different here and there. What we can offer is a set of uh, different potential opportunities of collaboration and engagement. And actually, one of the purposes of the UN, as in China, in the UN Charter Article 1, is precisely that we are here at the United Nations to um, foster cooperation at the international level, at the global level, in a number of issues. So I believe if we take down that concept of international cooperation, which tends to be a lot of... Uh, um, member state driven if we take it down to the very 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 local level we can have and we actually do have a system of international cooperation that is not driven by governments it's not driven by companies it's not driven not even by universities it's driven by peoples uh by by peoples here and there and they change ideas and solutions via social media or via any other communication device or means if there is such technology available and if there is such connectivity so we have this opportunity to learn from each other but also to exchange ideas and i believe this is the perfect way to perhaps not create empathy in the strict sense of the term but certainly to acknowledge the fact that yes we might be suffering, for example, lack of gender equality in one country, but perhaps we have a similar country on the other side of the world that's facing similar challenges. What can we learn from them? What can they learn from us? And maybe we have a solution, we find a solution in between. Uh, you you landed on the really good last word solution, <laughs> which is, I, I think there's a lot of solutions that came up to today in this conversation. and to how to build local to global community engagement. And I, I wanna finish up, this is our last parallel session of the conference. So thank you everybody. Um, and as we close, I would like you all to share something that is your hope for the future for local and global community engagement. What would your hope be? We've, we've mentioned a lot about um, inclusivity, preserving local cultures and language. Um, 
So I'll, I'll pass it over to whoever would like to start to share your hopes for the future. Maria. Well, <clears throat> for me, the future is green, yeah. So I hope uh, that, that, that that future happens um, with a lot of peace. <laughs> Um, and the empathy of everybody to listen, no? Listen is very important. What do you want? What do you want to, to do? What do you want to receive? What do you want to be talking about, no? And this is my hope for the future. So I hope this for everybody. <laughs> if I may uh, jump in. If I'm not mistaken, yesterday or the day before was the International Day of Tolerance as promoted by UNESCO. And I always have a problem with that particular term because I always say, well, to be tolerant is not much. It's just that you barely stand the other person. I believe we have to be uh, more understanding of the others, uh, which goes to what Maria was saying about the empathy. You need to understand the realities of other people. You need to understand their needs. You need to understand their thoughts. You need to understand their views. And this applies to our neighbors, our you know neighbors are across the border. Uh, that applies to literally every single human being. The more we understand each other, the mm -hmm. the more uh, sustainable future, uh, a more peaceful future, uh, we will have for sure. Yeah, I totally agree with it. Yeah, and if you ask me, my hope for the future is very simple: is well peace. Yeah, and but one thing that I want to call from uh, a Chinese philosopher called Sun Zi, and he actually mentioned about that, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. So, uh, you know, this actually all align with what Maria and also Amal mentioned, yeah, and develop empathy, listening skills, understand each other's, but actually what we need is you involve me and I learn and I listen, because that's only the way that we know about the need of others yeah and then so we understand about, about the need of others and then so that actually will make us easier and no need to have tolerance because you understand and then you can actually try to see what you can do yeah so that's actually what we can do together yeah thank you all for sharing so wonderfully i learned a lot from this session i'm sure that our audience did too thank you for closing up the conference for us and uh Hope you have a wonderful evening or morning wherever you are in the world. And uh, yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Gracias. Hasta luego.